This is a video for how to use the Decision Strategies VOI tool. Decision Strategies consultants have an average of over 20 years experience in their respective industries. As outside facilitators, we excel at teaching teams to frame their decisions, generate clear alternatives for consideration, and rigorously test these alternatives against a world of risk and uncertainties. If you're interested in speaking directly with a Decision Strategies veteran consultant, then please contact us today, www.decisionstrategies.com. This is a how-to video for a simple value of information tool, one we use when facilitating client sessions to answer the question, how much is more information worth? If a test could tell you an outcome of a key uncertainty before you had to make your decision, how much should you be willing to pay for it? And what if this test isn't perfectly accurate? In this how-to video, we'll walk through an example in which an oil company is trying to decide if they should collect more information before drilling a well. The company believes there is geologic structure that could potentially contain oil. They know the cost to drill the well and have an estimate of value they'll achieve if there is oil in this structure. They also have the option to collect additional seismic data. This information will not tell them for certain that there are or are not hydrocarbons in the formation. But if the company sees specific anomalies in the data, then they'll view the presence of oil as more likely. So is this information worth the cost? Should the company acquire the seismic data, or should they make a decision based on what they already know? Let's start the how-to. I've opened up the tool, and I'm going to save it as a macro-enabled workbook. I'll call this VOI example dot xlsm. Next, I'm going to click on the tab labeled Two Choice VOI Sheet. As our example decision involves picking between two choices, either we will drill the well or we will not drill the well. We'll title our decision, Drill Well. And our alternatives under consideration are either to drill the well or don't drill the well. And our major uncertainty is whether or not hydrocarbons are present. And the outcomes of the uncertainty will either be yes, hydrocarbons are present, or no, they are not. We've spoken with the company experts, and they believe, given the information that they have now, that there's a 60% probability that hydrocarbons are in fact present. Now we'll need to enter the economic values associated with each possible decision and outcome scenario. We've again spoken with our subsurface and economic experts at the company, and they've told us that if we decide to drill the well, and there is in fact oil present, then we'll achieve an expected value result of $10 million. For the sake of neatness, I'll simplify and leave off the zeros, call it 10. The experts told us that if we drill the well, and there are in fact no hydrocarbons present, then we'll have sunk $4 million with no return. If we don't drill the well, our cost is $0, and our return is also zero regardless of whether or not hydrocarbons were present. We then scroll down and can see our information entered into a decision tree. The squares represent decision nodes and the circles represent our uncertainties. Our decision is whether or not to drill the well and our uncertainty is the presence of hydrocarbons. On the very far right, we can see the values associated with each branch of the tree. And if we multiply these values by their probabilities and sum, we get our expected values at each uncertainty node. Here at the top, we multiply 10 by 60% and add it to negative 4 times 40% to get an expected value of 440. On the bottom, we multiply 0 times 60% 
plus 0 times 40 percent to get an expected value of 0. At this point we hit a square decision node and instead of a calculation we simply decide to make a choice with the highest expected value. In this case the best decision is to drill the well. Occasionally we may have reason to not simply choose the branch with the highest expected value. Perhaps if the values are very close but the downside risk associated with one option is much greater than the risk associated with the other. In this case we could override the calculation and manually state what our decision would be given no additional information. Our tutorial will stick with the calculated choice of drilling the well. The next step is to figure out the value of perfect information. If we could somehow know, without error, what the outcome of our uncertainty would be, what would that information be worth? To do this, we first flip the tree around, now placing the uncertainty node in front of the decision nodes. In our example, with perfect information, we would know whether or not there were hydrocarbons present before we made the decision to drill. If there are hydrocarbons and we do drill, then the expected value will be 10 million, and if we don't, the expected value is zero. If no hydrocarbons are present and we decide to drill, our EV is negative 4 million, and again, if we don't drill, our expected value is zero. So clearly, if we knew there were hydrocarbons present, we would drill at an expected value of 10. And if we knew they were not present, we would choose to not drill at an expected value of zero. We then continue to roll back our tree, multiplying our 10 million by the probability of hydrocarbons and zero by the probability of no hydrocarbons to get a perfect information tree expected value of 6 million. Our original tree with no information equated out to 4.4 million. So having the information is worth 1.6 million, 6 minus the original 4.4. Of course, in real life, we rarely are able to obtain perfect information that will definitively tell us the future state of an uncertainty. Rather, we are able to run tests, implement pilot programs, conduct surveys, and so on, that will give us an indication of how the uncertainty may resolve. This brings us down to Section 2, Understanding the Value of Imperfect Information. In our example, we have the option to acquire seismic data for our prospect. Remember that we said the information won't tell us for certain whether or not hydrocarbons are present, but if seismic anomalies are seen in the data, we'll have a good indication that oil is present. We'll assess our experts again, this time as to the reliability of our seismic data. How often will the seismic data correctly reflect the actual state of reality? Often this is a point of controversy when working with clients. They are hesitant to provide accuracy probabilities as they aren't exactly certain as to what they are. Not to worry, you can come back to these inputs later and continue to change them until you see the decision choice result change. Often it takes quite a high inaccuracy before the results change. The team may not know exactly how accurate the test is, but they feel comfortable that it is better than the extreme numbers entered and then they can proceed in their confident decision. Going row by row, if hydrocarbons are actually present, then our test will result in what I'll call seismic anomaly seventy-five percent of the time. Going down a row, and again looking at the case where hydrocarbons are actually present, then our tests will result in no seismic anomaly, twenty-five percent of the time, a false negative. Skipping down a row, when hydrocarbons are not actually present, then our test will result in no seismic anomaly 70% of the time. And seismic anomaly, a false positive, 30% of the time. We now scroll down to see our information populated into a tree of uncertainty nodes. The first tree reflects the natural order of the uncertainties. The hydrocarbons either are or are not in the ground, and that drives the probability of seeing the different seismic results. But in real life, what we first see are the results of our seismic, and what we wish to know 
is the probability of hydrocarbons. So we flip the order of the tree. being careful to put our probabilities on the right branches, and then calculate both our probabilities of seeing each of the seismic results, here 57% and 43%, and our probabilities of the presence of hydrocarbons given each result. Here roughly 7921 in favor of hydrocarbons if we see an anomaly, and 3565 in favor of no hydrocarbons if we do not see an anomaly. We then need to enter our cost to acquire the information. I'll scroll down and I'm going to put zero dollars so that the result of the tool will tell me the absolute maximum I should be willing to pay for this imperfect information. I will say that it will take no time to acquire the seismic data and we won't worry about the discount rate as these are more critical when your test is very long term such as building and running a pilot program for a few years. We then scroll down and over to the right and we can see um, the option to place custom expected values at the ends of each branch. We're just going to stick with the information we entered at the beginning but sometimes you may need to enter specific expected values if the decision to acquire or not acquire the information complicates the economics. For example, if you had a contractual agreement with a host government to run the seismic and not doing so would incur a contractual penalty. We then come over and look at the rolled back value of the tree and can see that our expected value when we acquire the imperfect seismic data is $4.4 .4 million. It is less than our value with perfect information and the same as our expected value if we had just gone out and drilled the well without acquiring the seismic data. So we can conclude that we should not pay for the seismic and we should just go ahead and drill the well. This concludes the tutorial and we thank you for using the VOI tool. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us at www.decisionstrategies.com.